Uh, that's Michael Colin, and we're talking about the electric vehicle charging station initiative uh, that was uh, uh, just in the paper a day or two ago. A very important initiative, and it's an extension of what Hawaiian Electric has been doing. And, and he's involved in that, in the, in the transportation, electrification of transportation uh, in Hawaiian Electric. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, um, you know, let, let's talk about, you know, this is, this is really central for you, because if we're going to do uh, electrification of transportation, this is what we got to do. And we had 16,000 electric vehicles in the state. And it's it's going inexorably up, but we want it to go up faster. And, and charging stations clearly the way to do that. You incentivize people. Um, you, you you deal with their range anxiety and you know, all that. Um, and so uh, what you're proposing, what One Electric is proposing, is right in the center of the channel here. It it is the thing that will incentivize people to buy and use those cars. So, so tell me about how Hawaiian Electric looks at this. Uh, what, is, what is important about this initiative and why now? Well, um, as you know, Hawaiian Electric has been in the public charging space for about seven years. We started out with a pilot back in 2013. Um, small scale limited pilot across our service territory to try and um, support you know, that fledgling uh, EV space as e people were adopting EVs. Hawaiian Electric's been involved in electric, electric vehicles uh, from the beginning. Uh, more recently, as the first Nissan Leafs were delivered to the state, I think the state of Hawaii got the first one, Hawaiian Electric got the second. Um, we developed rates starting um, for EV charging back in 2010. Um, but really it's grown and as it's grown, uh, it, we've seen the need to take a more uh, firm position in this growth to support uh, that transition. There's a lot of benefits from transitioning to clean transportation. Um, as you know, we have a renewable portfolio standard for electricity generation, which will be 100% clean by 2045. Um, but one of the remaining largest emitters of uh, carbon is in the transportation sector. So a light duty uh, ICE internal combustion engine that runs on gasoline will always emit the same amount of particulate matter for the lifetime of the vehicle. If you, uh, with an EV on Hawaiian Electric's grid, over time it will get cleaner and cleaner. That's an important first, you know, right out the gate, we need to do something to support that. Yeah, that's one of the questions that was posed here. Um, what is it? Um, it's only as clean uh, as the fuel source. So if the fuel source is coal or uh, oil, it's, uh, you're not running on renewables at all. It's, uh, it may sound like it's electric, but it's really coal and oil. Now, as you move away from coal and oil, which um, you know, hopefully we can do that really soon, um, then it becomes purely clean energy. So Correct. I think that's an important point for you to make, yeah. Correct, and um, there's a few things to that also. Electric vehicles are just straight up as compared to an ICE vehicle and internal combustion are more efficient just in their operations. But you couple that with an increasingly clean uh, electricity generation source and uh, you have a more clean vehicle. Um, we also are trying to incentivize vehicle charging when we are producing the most renewables. So all of our electric vehicle rates are cheapest during the day when the solar uh, production is at its peak. So the combination of the two actually do have a, a more positive uh, benefit in, even in the near term uh, as compared to internal combustion vehicles. So that's, that's very important. Um, the other piece, and I think, you know, getting back to your first question about why now um, is, Supporting growth, um, there has been pretty sparse third party non-utility investment in the public charging space so far. Um, there have been a fair amount of level two charging stations being deployed. Um, however, fast charging uh, is extremely limited. There's only, I think right now, two non Hawaiian electric owned uh, fast charging stations in the state. So 
we are looking to expand that um, and support growth, maybe lay the foundation for in increased growth, which would build a market so that other investors, uh, non-utility investors can also come in and build a business case for them to make those investments in the state. Yeah, you know, I'm, um, it's true. I, I don't know why, but it just hasn't been profitable for an investor, an entrepreneur to come in and um, get a piece of uh, geography from a gas station, for example, and set up um, a, a charging facility right there. It would seem to me a, a natural, um, but for some reason it doesn't really work. And I wonder, you know, if the state is watching this, uh, I mean, the state energy people, they would say, wouldn't they say, look, why don't we give them a tax credit or a tax holiday uh, while they build these things? So we'll have all these uh, young, just perfect, perfect entrepreneurial situation, isn't it? Because you know it's going to be bigger and bigger as time goes on. Um, so, you know, I, so I can build it for 10, 10, 15, $20,000. Um, and then I can, um, you know, make a little money on it. And it's there for as long as my lease with the gas station lasts. And, and um, if they give me a tax holiday, I'm in. I do that. Everybody yeah, absolutely. That, you know? Yeah. And Hawaiian Electric, we support investment. Um, in fact, you know, the scope for this proposal that we're talking about today really is only a subset of the total forecasted need. Um, we, didn't, we didn't come out of the gate trying to take the entire charging market. We do believe that there needs to be investment from other areas. Um, and so that's part of why we only are, are proposing a, you know, a, a piece of the total need in, in 2030. Um, there is- I think we should of, all appreciate that, Michael. I mean, you're stepping in because there's a vacuum. You're stepping in because there's not enough exactly you know, um, you construction know. going on. You're you're doing it almost a, in a, a a charitable way in the sense that nobody else is doing it, and it has to be done. Um, and so I think I think you know, the community can appreciate that Hawaiian Electric is doing the right thing here, and not in, not intending to cover the island with all of its own charging stations, just to sort of incentivize the building of charging stations and the purchase of electric vehicles. Exactly. And, and studies have shown that when people are considering to adopt an electric vehicle rather than uh, switch away from internal combustion, one of the key factors in their decision is knowing that there's public charging available, even if they don't intend to use it. So even if you live at home and plan on charging at home, knowing that there's public uh, charging stations out there actually makes a big difference for people to um, pull the trigger and, and actually buy an electric vehicle. Well, so sure. we think there's I tell my wife value. all the time. I say, why don't you buy an electric car? She likes cars. Why don't you buy an electric car? She says, not enough charging stations. I'm worried about range anxiety. It's that simple. So you hit the ball, you know, right on the head with this project. One of the other things that I think is important about this project and about why Hawaiian Electric is doing this. Um, even with external companies, non-utility non companies coming in and making investments, what they're looking for to build a business case is utilization. So they're going to locate in places where they are guaranteed high utilization to get the biggest return on their investment um, as soon as possible. While that's true for us too, um, we also value and see, see value in citing uh, charging infrastructure where the market isn't yet developed. So uh, LMI communities, um, more rural locations where you may not see the level of utilization for a while, but you can start, build the market, incentivize, and also help encourage people to think about electric vehicles next time they, they are looking for a different transportation solution. Well, you're going so, to a, a, a fair amount of trouble to invite people in to express themselves on where these... Uh, charging station and should be cited. You had all kinds of meetings and people have expressed all kinds of suggestions to you uh, about where, um, where, where they should be cited. And it's so what kind of reaction are you getting? I mean, um, are, are the people who make these suggestions already owners of electric vehicles or are they um, you know, putative owners who may buy in the future? So, you know, one of the lessons learned from this pilot um, was there's a lot of different elements that go into siting. Siting requires 
a you know an agreement between us and a site host so they have to be willing on the other side to um you know allow us to have access to the location and, and site of charging station that um that approach is important though because uh we get community buy-in and and we developed we've been listening to stakeholders all along you know as we uh build out our pilot and then in anticipation of this expansion application we met with a lot of stakeholders um and then we also tried to just get like a survey of input from folks we set up this uh, interactive web tool called charge up hawaii um which we asked you know, people to essentially share their mobility needs and where they think EV charging stations are needed. Is that still um, working? Is that still up there? It is. It is. It's chargeuphi.com. Mm -hmm. um, and you can drop a pin and answer a few survey questions. You can drop a pin on an interactive map and essentially show where you would think you would like to uh, where charging stations should be needed. And you can provide a little insight feedback like, oh, this is right next to my work, or this is, you know, some along a very popular roadway. So we intend to gather that information and, you know, overlay it with some of our other uh, forecasting models to understand exactly what people's needs are. And it, it will help us in sighting in the future. Well, let me let me go to that. Uh, you know, one of the one of the questions uh, on the list here is uh, um, you got to go to the PUC for this. Um, I guess it's, it's a fair amount of money involved, $97 million. That's a lot of money. Um, but um, the, do you need to go to them? And when you go to them, what, you know, what is the, um, the, uh, the level of detail that you have? Do you have to tell them about at every site you plan you know, to do this? Uh, or is it just a, we want to do 300 charging stations and how about checking off on the box? So that's a good question. We do have to go to the commission for approval. Um, because there's a an electric vehicle tariff rate that we charge. So anytime we charge an electric rate, we have to get commission approval for that. Plus uh, the investment and the recovery of the costs, um, we're making an application for those two pieces, right? As far as siting is concerned, um, rather than be very specific on the locations we ask we're asking for some flexibility in locations namely to uh continue to listen to community needs and foster that input and feedback um there's uh, a serious attempt and intent to uh, provide more equitable access and doing so requires meeting communities where they're at and listening and that's an ongoing thing it's not something that um we we would expect to just do a few meetings and then add a location to a list we wanted to continue as dynamics change as technology changes as community needs change to really listen and figure out siting as we move forward so we are asking for flexibility we've we've done a, a rough proportionality uh percentage across our service territories so 60% on Oahu 20% on Maui and 20% on Hawaii Island however that's not set in stone we're really looking to uh address community needs and, and figure out what how best we can serve and provide kind of the best impact uh in moving forward as far as the timeline um you know it it is a regulatory process it's kind of unique um way electric utilities do business so that application process goes through kind of like a like a mini case like a legal case contested case and you and you have different parties so that process can take a while um what, so why i mean what has to be decided i mean this is a great idea this is this is it works for the utility it works for the public it works for you know green energy it works for climate change uh, who would oppose anything like that? What you know? What are the issues that they would have to resolve? What's the difficulty here? I don't think anyone probably would contest all of those points. Um, really, it's the commission's job to determine whether our application is within the public interest, and so they're not just looking at you know some of the benefits, but also the cost impact to all customers, and they'll be determining whether the scope and the way we went about developing it we did our due diligence um and so that's that's really what they're looking for and then also the rate design you know um 
the rates have to do a lot of different things. They have to incentivize utilization, but they can't. They also have to accommodate a certain level of costs uh, to do business and, and operate. And so that's part of kind of, uh, you know, a fine balance of um, some of the work that we're doing and trying to design a rate that's low and we're trying to make it lower than the current pilot rate. We're trying to make it roughly uh, competitive with the price of gasoline uh, and more so during the day than you know in the evening at nighttime. Um, but doing all those things, the commission will, will evaluate that and make sure that um, you know we did our homework and that the eventual outcome of all this will be in the public interest. Well, that's pretty appealing. It's appealing that uh, you know, you're using the time of day as a as a, uh, a metric for how much, but it's also appealing that you're knocking off. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly what the reduction was, but the contemplated reduction was like 40, 50, 60 percent. That's a substantial reduction from what uh, the same person would have to pay uh, if he took it uh, out of the grid, um, you know, without not, not at a charging station. So that's that's impressive. Um, and, you know, to me, uh, that sells itself right there and it sells people. It sells people. Things, oh, wow, I can get it cheap. Um, but, you know, every time, Michael, that you open transparency, and I'm sure the company has seen this, we've all seen this, as soon as you say, hey, come in, let us have your feedback, you know what you're going to get. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and it, you know, it may be uh, that, that people are sympathetic and understand, and it may be that they raise issues you didn't anticipate. Um, for example, hmm, I paid my dues by putting solar on my roof and I want to charge my car from my roof or from a battery that I have. I don't, as a rate payer, I don't need to have these 300 charging stations because I already paid for mine. I don't care about the other guys. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's a possibility there, don't you think? Yes, I think that's a possibility. I think um, that's a valid concern. Cost of uh, electricity is impacts everybody. Um, what we're trying to do long term, and we build this into our discussion a little bit, and we did this in our strategic roadmap, which we filed a couple of years ago as well, is to show how over time increased sales revenue from all of these new electric vehicles it doesn't contribute to Hawaiian Electric's bottom line. We're revenue decoupled, which is a whole complicated regulatory scheme. But essentially, any increase in electricity sales contributes to decreasing our fixed costs. And those fixed costs, when they're lowered, reduces rates that we would then charge everybody. So over time, as EVs grow, there'll become a point where all of that new EV growth will help to bring down rates. That's what we're trying to achieve. Um, and that's really important. I think that could address some of those cost concerns. Mm -hmm. There are people, I think, who are really ready to be essentially off-grid or self-supporting. And in those cases, you know, it's really a question of, you know, if you want to buy an EV, maybe you will use a public charger at some point. You know, for you, it might not be an always, but a nice to have. Um, but it's really going to be, as all electric utility assets are, they're, you know, um, they're for the public and they're serving a public good. And so uh, as, as we all train, transition and go through a paradigm shift here in our transportation, um, this will be kind of, you know, this is the new fuel source. And so that's, um, that's an important thing to kind of bear in mind as this transition happens. So um, so many questions flood my mind, Michael. Um, um, one is, um, what about hydrogen cars? You know, uh, there's a dealer that has them. A Toyota dealer has them. Um, I forget the name of the car, but um, they're they're not cheap. They're more expensive than electric cars, but ultimately they're electric because the fuel cell works. You know, um, on electricity on a battery. So um, the question I put to you is, uh, where where does that fit? And for example, if I have an installation of um, a, a electric charging station. Uh, would it would it be something cons to consider to put in a hydrogen charging station right next to it? Is that is that in the woodwork somewhere? Um, so Hawaiian Electric, I mean, even though we you know sell electricity, we're not um, 
we're not engaging any kind of like, you know, pushing out other kind of technologies. Um, hydrogen certainly has its place. I think really just in looking at the market, it may just be a uh, market readiness uh, thing. You know, EVs have really kind of jumped forward. There's a lot of different vehicle models, a lot of different charging station providers. So they're a little bit further along. Um, that's not to say that hydrogen doesn't have a place that Toyota Mirai, I think it's called, Mirai. Um, is a very nice vehicle. Um, you know, the installation of the charging or the refueling stations, um, I think are, you know, there, there aren't too many. Um, but there may be cer certain circumstances that as we get deeper into this transition to clean transportation, where hydrogen really does make more sense. So, you know, we are looking at at those things, you know, there's there's been some talks about the Big Island or maybe some heavy duty uses. Um, eventually, making hydrogen requires electricity, most for the most part, um, or can require electricity. So we we view that as also an opportunity, and we're we're looking to find ways to support that as well as um, as that technology kind of gets more mature and they find um, specific use cases for it. Yeah, uh, maybe maybe uh, I mean there are people who want to see buses fueled by hydrogen and, and working for that. So maybe, you know, as, as time goes by, you see that um, buses have more hydrogen and, and um, ordinary vehicles uh, have more electricity, electric vehicles. Um, so I want to sort of paint a picture in my mind, Michael, about how this is going to work. So uh, you're not going to add uh, 300 charging stations on day one. Uh, what I'm getting from this conversation is it you're going to do it over time. You're going to do it dynamically. You're going to learn about siting. You're not going to know about all the 300 sites on day one. You're going to see how that works out and build them where, you know, people people have come to find that they're useful. It could be different on day two and ten and a year down the road. The other thing is, if if I go to a charging station uh, that you're going to build, you're going to actually contract the building and build these things, right? Um, then I bring my credit card and uh, I put my credit card in, right? And, uh, and, and then I charge my, my vehicle and it charges me on my credit card, like any other credit card purchase. Is that the way it would work? Yes, so um, actually there's a couple ways that you can pay uh, currently and we anticipate that being uh, replicated again. It's, you can either use point of sale credit card or you can uh, use a phone app with the uh, network provider. So there's a network service provider who does the transacting um, and that service provider um, has a phone app, you know, the, um, so you can come up with your phone, prepay on their app or have it charged directly through your phone. So there's, there's actually uh, two ways to pay. Well, that's great. I love the phone app idea. That's great, that's easier. That's easier on, on, on Hawaiian Electric, the seller too, because uh, they don't have to have all that equipment, electronics in, you know, in, in, in the box, so to speak. Um, I can just get on my phone. And, you know, indeed, there are other countries in the world, other situations uh, where that's exactly what they do. You, you go to an app, you say what you want, and it happens. And the only thing Hawaiian Electric needs is a, a message, you know, from the telephone network saying, you know, feed this guy some electricity. Simple. That, that's that's actually a, a, a more efficient way to do it. Yeah, um, and then there's some benefits also from using the phone app as you can tell uh, whether the charge station is in use or not. So you can kind of plan your trip. Um, and then I think some more advanced phone apps actually allow for queuing, um, which is something we'll be exploring as well. What is queuing? Queuing is, uh, you know, if, if there's more than one vehicle who's looking to charge at a given location, you can essentially reserve your space in, in, in virtual line uh, and then be able to access the charger. Yeah, so that's, to, that's a technology. The car, right? You have to have room for uh, uh, the car to park. So yeah. uh, what, what, what about a gas station? Would that be a good location, a good site? Um, so gas, so charging is a little bit different right now than gasoline in terms of the, um, you know, duration that it takes to refuel. Gas stations are really built around five five minutes, five to 10 at the most refueling 
with you know convenience purchases attached. Um, charging is a little bit longer. The the higher capacity charging stations that are uh, being you know deployed elsewhere, and and we're looking at bringing some here too over time. Um, those will shorten duration times, but they're, you're still looking at you know uh, 15 minute, 30 minute uh, wait time to really fully charge your vehicle or get it most of the way charged uh, with the real fast charger. So um, it may make sense. There were um, at the Kahala gas station right on that corner um, by the on ramp. They used to actually have charging stations, um, but I don't think it made sense for them. Um, this was a while back, but so I, I think just the, the sitting and waiting at a gas station thing may not make the most sense, but as charging uh, times come down, then it, then it may be more akin to uh, gasoline refueling and, and it would make more sense. Yeah, I caught that in uh, the newspaper that um, 150 of them were, uh, what do you call it? Um, high, 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 high voltage uh, charging. And then the other 150 were two lower voltage chargers. Um, why don't you make them all high voltage? And how do you make the distinction about where to put a, uh, the one kind with the high voltage and the other kind with the, the two lower voltage? How do you decide? I mean, I would always want the high voltage, wouldn't I? And we suspect that's the case. Um, the level two, the lower, slower charging is really the result of feedback that we received um, from different stakeholders who were interested in having some form of charging even while they're waiting for fast charging. So right now we've got, you know, um, some really high utilization, highly utilized charge stations, for example, are ones at our ward facility right at Hawaiian Electric. We've got two fast chargers there. Um, that's our most heavily utilized, and we think it's because there's a lot of residential, you know, high rise buildings around it's downtown, very central located. Um, but, but there's a lot of queuing. And so people have asked us, um, you know, it'd be great as if we could just get a level two charge while we're waiting. And it's a it's a cheaper to install, and so we're looking at doing a kind of a preferred configuration for our uh, buildouts where we try to put two fast chargers and one level two, and that leaves a, a number of level two still. But we're just trying to have some flexibility in the configuration. May may have more level twos at a given site, may have less, but essentially be more like a hub everywhere we go. We think that would make better sense, it'll be more efficient in terms of the construction dollars you're, you're putting more in at a given time, because really the biggest cost isn't the charge stations itself, it's the construction, you know, putting down the lines, upgrading, maybe making some uh, service upgrades and things like that. So if you do it once and have more at a given site, um, then we think that makes more sense. Not every site can accommodate that, so that's part of why we're asking for some flexibility in the way we how we deploy and how we design at a given site. But that's really what it what it's primarily for. There's also hybrid vehicles. Um, hybrid vehicles cannot fast charge um, because they have the gasoline motor on board. So hybrid vehicles can only charge at level two or, or lower. So there might be a few you know, use cases where hybrid vehicles can um, take advantage of our public charging as well. So we'd wanna support that. Oh, you might change this though. I mean, I my re reaction to see the 150 of this kind and 150 of that kind is, you, you might you might decide in a year or two, depending on feedback, depending on you know the experience you're having with with this project, that maybe you need more of this kind or less of that kind, and you might change the ratio. Am I right? That's correct. And so we learned a lot from our pilot. But scaling is not something we were able to really learn. We will learn as we move up. And so trying to design out of the gate the perfect kind of solution, we, we knew that that wouldn't be the case. So we are really just trying with a, with a theory of a preferred configuration and, and continuing to garner feedback. And we'll just, you know, we're hoping to get that flexibility so that we can really meet the needs and adjust accordingly. If the technology and the future is really pushing towards higher capacity charge uh, fast charging you know like the supercharging stations that you see from tesla if we can you know if that's the way that the trends are going then we would 
you know, want to look into that and um, accommodate that. So that's, that's really, but as far as how we propose it, we built it around the assumption of fat, DC fast and level two. And that was help us, that was in order to help us figure out kind of cost components and, and figure out what the scope of the overall project would ultimately be so that we could get our hands around it. Yeah, right. I mean, there's all kinds of things, experiences to have and learn from. I mean, for example, for example, um, suppose uh, you, 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 hit, you hit a great location. This is a site that's it's like magnetic. It's going to draw people in that neighborhood. They're all going to buy you know, electric vehicles. So they're all going to want that place. And they're all going to get on the queue, which I suppose would be electronic. So <clears throat> the queue says, oh, there are 20 people. And they all want to charge. They'll never get through the day. Um, maybe the queue also says, you know, I'm thinking artificial intelligence. And um, maybe what we're going to say is, look, you can't charge your whole battery up here. Uh, we're going to give you a couple, you know, a couple of, we're going to give you a percentage of your battery. We're going to enough to drive around for a while, uh, maybe a, a day's charge, but not two days charge. And then the next guy in the queue has to get his turn. Is this a possibility? That is a possibility. We, we had explored, um, you know, some technology that could limit and that may be something we would do in the future. Right now, we don't think there, there is that level of utilization, um, but it, it could certainly happen. And if that's the case, I think rather than kind of turn away folks, it, it would probably make more sense for us to evaluate looking into a higher capacity charging mm -hmm. delivery. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you know, in the interim, I think that's that's an important element uh, to consider is, is figuring out ways to make sure that people can get what they need um, to get around. But if if there are some limitations that we want to explore that. Very exciting time, really. Um, so I'm thinking this. I'm thinking that over a few years, um, not not all the way through 2030, but, you know, somewhere after 2023, you you you, you install them all, you know, and you're in place. Now you're in place. And now it's a learning experience and, and all that. Um, and it's a learning experience for the consumer too. Um, and I guess the question I put is, you know, what happens after um, 2030? Because this, this is going to be dynamic and you could have a huge effect on the number of electric vehicles that people buy in the state because of this project. Uh, you know, we, you were doing it before, but in smaller numbers. Now, this is the biggest project ever for electric charges, for electric vehicles. You know, it's huge, really, you know, to, relative to Hawaii. Um, so you could have a, a, a huge jump in the number of vehicles. So here we are, you know, in 2030. What do you expect is going to happen then? <sighs> Two things, I think. Um, and part of, part of the reason why we we're trying to do something significant is to accelerate, right? To, to boost decarbonization, it's um, becoming more and more pressing every day. And so, you know, we think act, bold action now is, makes a lot of sense. Um, the 2030 was essentially a kind of target for us to finish deploying the charging infrastructure. We may finish sooner, uh, but that's, you know, the anticipated timeline for the deployment. Once we're done with that, um, I think 2030 was also a really good inflection point in terms of forecast and looking at what the technologies may be, what the landscape may be. So we fully anticipate that the charge stations will continue to be in service up and running, um, but maybe there are other kinds of solutions needed for that next phase, right? So this proposal was built to support a growth uh, you know, and a forecasted growth, but growth will continue beyond 2030 and probably even more so between that decade, right? 2030 and 2040, it will be a deepening of the technology, a lot of different use cases, different technologies being deployed, maybe higher battery capacities. So all of those things kind of lend itself to us saying, okay, 2030 is a good stopping point for us with this forecast, with this design, with this concept. 2030 and beyond may look a lot different. And so at that point, we, would, we wouldn't want to presume to do the same thing as what we're doing now. And we think, you know, 
um, that's a good point to stop and look forward and say, you know, let's let's do X, Y, and Z differently. And so as we get closer to 2030, um, we'll be looking at that and trying to figure out different kinds of solutions. Yeah. And that being planning. said also, yeah, it's all about planning and, and, um, and, and that's also, you know, this is just one component of a suite of different things that we are proposing right now. We've been doing public charging for a long time. So this is kind of further along on the timeline. But we also propose uh, pilots for make ready uh, infrastructure where we just build up to the point of the charging station and then let a site host uh, own and operate the charge station. So essentially we're trying to uh, mitigate some of the costs of deployment. That could really work for other types of use cases uh, for bus, you know, we have one for bus or for other types of commercial use cases. So um, that also is a solution and it's currently in a pilot and proposed pilot and, and the e-bus is actually in the pilot phase. So once we start learning more about that, um, we can accelerate that program if, uh, if it makes sense from the commission standpoint and from the company standpoint. Uh, so that could also be a different type of solution. It doesn't just have to be you know, company owned um, public charging. Uh, it could be other, other types of business models. So we're trying to help kind of do it in different ways. Yeah, well, that's, that's actually, to me, that has all the badge of success on it because then you bring in investors and, uh, you know, investors are more than investors. They're members of the community um, and that would in incentivize them, you know, if they can make a buck and uh, you know, you're doing the, um, you know, the infrastructure and they do the, uh, you know, the equipment at the end of the line. Uh, they make a few bucks. Um, takes the, the, the capital burden off the line electric to some extent. Um, that'd be a great thing to work on. Um, I only have one more question. We're kind of out of time, Michael, and see how quickly the time goes. Um, you know, I, I know you're, you're, you, you support addressing climate change. I know that. You're in the green energy business. That's what you're in. So my question is, how come you're not in Glasgow now? <laughs> I can ask my boss that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there's always COP 27, you know. Yeah, you can, yeah maybe. Work. <laughs> I start paddling now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Michael Cologne of Hawaiian Electric. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was a great discussion. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Have a good Aloha. one. Aloha. Aloha.